continuing on in our regular week by week study. Um, and we find ourselves continuing through Hebrews, Hebrews chapter 6. Uh, we'll, we're only going to tackle eight verses here today just because we're in that sticky spot of Scripture here, verse 4 down through 12. Uh, but we will, we, will, uh, we will complete all of those verses here. And um, I put a title on today's message, How Do I Respond to the Difficult? Now, <clears throat> Why, that, why we could think about that, I guess, in the vein of responding to difficult people, the title is not geared towards that. It's not geared towards difficult people. It is geared really responding to the difficult circumstances or, or maybe the passages of difficulty that we find within the scriptures when God is speaking to us, when God is calling us to move in, in certain directions and there's that, you know, maybe the trepidation that we have and maybe it's like, well, God, I'm not quite sure about all of these particular things. And when God calls us to do something difficult, you know, our response is to step out and to trust him and to move, in, 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 move by faith. And that is nothing more than our trust is in him. Lord, I've heard you. I've seen it confirmed. We're moving in this direction. Okay, Lord, I don't see it with my eyes. I don't understand how this works. But, but when difficult things come, how do I respond when difficult things show up? Now, if you will remember with me, uh, as we survey the scriptures and we look into the life of Jesus, we look into the ministry of Jesus, that when he was at work, he often brought his disciples to that crossroads of tough truths. And, and, and those tough truths often it's like stopped them. It's like, well, Lord, uh, what do I do with this? And those, those crossroads are where they had to do some introspection, if you will. They had to look inside their life. You know, they, they had to go to that place and chew on what Jesus said within his word. Okay, what is he saying here? They, they had to chew on that. They had, they had uh, many times within the gospels, we see them pulling Jesus aside after he's given a teaching, after he's given a parable to the crowd. And, and he takes them to the side and, and they're there asking him clarification. God, you said this, but what about that? And, and you know, Jesus is being so patient. And, and, and many times he says, do you have no faith? Do you still have no faith? You know, and, and I don't know how God responded, but I know how I would respond. Uh, I don't know that I would always, you know, it's like you're teaching those same things again, right? It's like your kids. It's like, have I told you once? I told you a thousand times. My kids are grown, so I don't say that anymore, but I feel like I remember that when my mom would tell me that. <laughs> but, but asking for clarification, they did that. They had to decide once they heard his word, once Jesus gave the clarification, they had to decide how to personally, what they were going to do with that. And really, church, it is no different for us today that we have to go through these same things. We got to chew on God's word. We, gotta, we, we have to enter into prayer and ask him for clarification. And, and, and then when God shows us something, then the choice is ours. We have to decide how we're going to respond to him. Now, here in the book of Hebrews, again, we're, you know, we're several months into this study. We're at chapter 6, almost halfway through this study. But Paul lays out some very, 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 very difficult content. Now, I know I, I volleyed this up last week here and told you that we were coming to this. We were entering chapter 6, which is uh, probably the most difficult chapter uh, in the entire New Testament to deal with. And as he lays this stuff out here today, what we're going to see in verse 4, 5, and 6, just on the general read over of this stuff, man, this stuff can cause our heads to spin. Uh, and, and, and somebody told me a story here <clears throat> between service. Uh, a fellow came up to me and, and, and thanked me for sharing this and said that in days gone by, he had called into a, uh, a, a radio program and he had questions on these verses. And as he shared his question and all that, it's like on the other side of the line, it was, there was, there was some uneasiness as to how to answer the questions that come out of these verses right here. Listen, Paul takes us headlong into this stuff. And, and, and again, we've got to chew on God's word. We've got to get a full understanding of what God has said here. We, we, we may have to, even after this service, go to that place and ask God for clarification as to how we apply it personally to our lives. But either way, we have to decide. We have to decide what, how we're going to respond to God in this. Take a look with me. Hebrews 6, starting in verse number 4, Paul writes this. Hold your seatbelts because your heads may spin. He says, For... It is impossible for those who were once enlightened and have tasted the heavenly gift and have become partakers of the Holy Spirit and have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the age to come if they fall away to renew them again to repentance 
since they crucify again for themselves the Son of God, and they put him to an open shame. For the earth with drinks in the rain that often comes upon it and bears herbs useful for those by whom it is cultivated receives blessings from God. But if it bears thorns and briars, it is rejected and near to being cursed, whose end is to be burned. But beloved, we are confident of better things concerning you. Yes, things that accompany salvation, though we speak in this manner. For God is not unjust to forget your work and your labor of love, which you have shown towards his name, and that you have ministered to the saints and do minister. And we desire that each one of you show the same diligence to the full assurance of hope until the end, that you do not become sluggish, but imitate those who through faith and patience inherit the promise. Father, we ask that you send your Holy Spirit to be our teacher in these verses, and that you would speak to us corporately, and that you would speak to us individually. And so we ask that you bless your word, and we do it in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Well, how do I respond to the difficult? How do I respond to the difficulty within these verses? A couple things that we can learn as we go through this. And first idea is this, is that this is technical. Verses 4, 5, and 6, this stuff is technical. And, and it is no secret that whether you're talking about pastors or commentators or, 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 or even scholars within our time, that these verses that we have just read through here, it causes our mind to spin and it, and it comes to those that are charged with explaining the way, it, it, it comes as something that is very difficult to do. Because you're looking at this and going, wait a minute, I had a bad step over here and I feel like I might be in a bad step right now. Does that mean I've lost my salvation? Is, is this what he's telling me? I, I mean, is that how God is speaking to me personally? Listen, press the pause button on all that for just a second, man. We need to understand the verse so that we can rightly apply it to our lives first. And these series of verses, why they are very, 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 very difficult to go through. They're tough. No question. And... For the sake of simplicity here this morning, I am going to teach you the same way that I have taught you guys time and again and again, really for the last 10 years. We're just going to take it verse by verse, which is why we slowed down to uh, you know, a couple handfuls of verses here today, and we're going so slow on this, is because we don't want to get this wrong. Because if I get this portion of Scripture wrong, I can move away in that place of condemnation and feel like God is against me rather than being for me. And, and, and man, there's nothing worse than coming to the church and feeling like that. It's like, man, I, I, I didn't feel too good coming in here, but now I'm here and now I really feel beat up. No, 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 God doesn't want you to feel that way. God is not driving you in that direction. If any place that God is driving to you, he's calling you into his loving arms. He's calling you to the cross of Christ. He's calling you to understand what his word has to say that you might share in the great comfort in which he has for us. And understanding his word is, is, is just a very, um, it, it's the tip of the iceberg of who God is. And so as we go through this, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to use the Greek words to unfold the text so that we can see, not in this crazy scholarly way, but in a very simple, like, okay, I can get that, man. Because when I read these verses here in our English language, that I, that I am moved to that place to where confusion washes upon me. And that's just, the, that's just how it goes, man. We're, we're, we're taking a document that's nearly 2,000 years old, and the original language in which it was brought forth is not, a, it's not English. It's not what you and I regularly speak. And so some of our English words, they doesn't all, it doesn't always do it justice to understand this would be one of those passages. Take a look at your Bible. Verse number four, he says, it is impossible for those who were once enlightened. Very first thing, we're going to go through a key of verses here. It's enlightened, it's taste, and it's partakers. These are the three keys to understanding what's going on in this, um, you know, this, this spread of verses right here. And so, enlightened. This is the Greek word photizo. And I'm an amazing Greek speaker. I didn't know it until I got here this morning. But I can speak it something great. Potizo is it. And here's, here's what it technically means. It means to give light. Okay? What do we know about Jesus? That the words that he speaks, that they're light, that they're life, that he's the light of the world, okay? And so, fotizo, to, to be given light, uh, the definition goes on to mean inspired with saving knowledge by teaching. In other words, the words that Christ came and he spoke, and we have them recorded within the gospel, as Jesus was speaking, that he was giving light. He was, he was giving and saying and speaking those things and teaching those things which pertain to salvation. There's only one way to the Father, and it's through him. 
He's the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except through Christ. And, and so being enlightened, fotizo, is, is something that God has given. And to be enlightened, while it is through teaching the gospel, there's something else that is attached to it, and that is the reception of it. In other words, you are receiving it. It's not that, it's not that you're giving information, information, information that you reject. No, no, no. It's, it's, it's the illumination of truth that is received by the heart, which leads to somebody moving into a place of obedience. Now, we go on down to the second one. And so, that's enlightened. And then he moves here to the second one, and that is, and have tasted the heavenly gift. Again, these are the key words within this text. So, so taste it. Uh, it sounds like it's a Halloween word. It's guo. So guo. And this means to feel or experience. You know, uh, if, if you think about your life, think about the times that you, maybe the first time you came to church or, or maybe what you've experienced over the years of, of coming to church and, and, and assembling as the saints. You know, maybe you've been there in those times where it's, where it's man, you've, man, you've just heard a great worship song. It's like, oh man, that just, that just touched me. That just moved me emotionally. Or, or, you, or you sat through a message like this and it's like, well, God was just speaking to you in that particular passage of scripture. And it's like, man, God just, he's just moving and I feel it emotionally. You, you experience it in a, in a powerful way. That is guo. That's what this word means, to feel, to experience. Some have, have said this because it says tasting. Maybe it's just a trial run, right? You know, it's like when my wife, my wife's an amazing cook, by the way, uh, and she's always trying something new, and guess, guess who's the guinea pig? And now it's just coming to me. It explains why I'm so heavy. This is it. She's always giving me the taste test. But, but if you can think about tasting as, as, as just a trial run, right? It's like, you know, somebody comes to you and says, hey, taste this. It's like, well, you're not sure what it is yet. I don't, I don't know if I even really want this. Well, this is, this is it. You're, you're, you're just giving it a trial run, okay? You may have had an emotion. You may have had a feeling. You may have had an experience. Fine, 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 fine. Okay, good. Hold that thought. Moving on to the next one. Now he goes on down. Enlightened taste, now partakers of the Holy Spirit. Now, when we get to partakers, this is the, this is the word uh, metahas is the Greek word. And this means to be a, a participant or to be a sharer. And I want you to think with a gospel mind for just a second. We have 12 disciples or 12 apostles, maybe, may, maybe I should say. Now, was there one of those guys that was in there that maybe participated and kind of shared in the ministry of Jesus, but, but wasn't so much saved? Can, can, somebody, can somebody shout out or, or just say what his name was? Anybody remember? Yeah, Judas. That's right. He wasn't saved, but he shared in the benefits that Jesus graciously, graciously lived out. He shared in those things. He was a partaker, the, the metahas. I read something from Henry Ironside. I pulled his commentary, and back in 1932, he said this. It'll be on the screen here. He says, to be a partaker of the Holy Spirit is not at all the same thing as to be born of the Spirit, to be sealed by the Spirit, to be indwelt by the Spirit, to be anointed by the Spirit, to be baptized by the Spirit into the body of Christ. He goes on, and he says that a partaker is simply to be made aware of the mighty power of the Spirit working upon the hearts and the minds of men, bringing conviction and wooing the heart towards Christ. And he continues his comments about these verses here. He says, so it seems clear that these apostates were persons who had an outward acquaintance with Christianity, but they never knew what it was to receive the Lord Jesus as their own personal Savior. And gang, as we look at this portion of Scripture, verse 4, verse 5, verse 6, that why Paul has worked us through uh, this particular epistle, and, he, and he's come, and we've reached that point about midway through, and we've gone through three different warnings about what God was, was speaking through him and warning the church and warning specifically these folks, these second-generation Christians, as they were, they were getting dull, they were getting sluggish, they were fading back and all of that stuff. We know that, 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 that God wants to strengthen them, and he wants them to come forward. And Paul continues on in an example right behind this stuff of where we looked at the milk and the meat and what he was saying about all of this stuff. And now he gives this example in three verses. 
It, it, it's really, it's a bad contrast, if you will, of, 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 as he shares about these folks that were, that were enlightened, that had tasted, that were supposed to be partakers, and, and they shared in, in the ministry and all of these things. But he's not saying that these folks were saved. That's not what he's saying. He's saying that though they had these particular experiences, there was an intellectual knowledge of Christ, but not the repentance of accepting Christ. And in Henry Ironside, he kind of nails that down. Now, let's move a little bit farther here in the conversation here. Let's move on to the second idea, and, and let's see if we can open this up a little bit farther. Let's see if we can, you know, let the lion out of the cage. Let the gospel speak for itself. Let Christ do the work here. In verse number six, uh, let me give you the second idea. Second idea is, is that your life demonstrates your belief, okay? And in verse number six, he says that if they fall away to renew them again to repentance, uh, since they crucify again for themselves the Son of God, okay? These folks that were enlightened, these folks that had tasted, these folks that were partakers, again, not saved, but, uh, but just close enough to understand the depths of Christianity without making that commitment to Christ. And it's, it's, it's no different for a church in 2022. I mean, it's, it's even no different for this fellowship because there are times and there are, are seasons, and, and, and maybe even here this morning, I don't know, the, the, the folks walk through the back door of this church or any other church where they have the trinkets of Christianity. Hey, they carry a nice little Bible, man. They dress the part. They got their button-up shirt on or whatever. You know, they might know the lingo around the church and everything. You, you might even see these, these folks serving within churches. That is quite possible for sure. It happens. And yet not have that relationship with Christ. Not really be a born-again Christian. Not really be a believer in Christ. And the falling away here, the idea that, it, that carries out of verse number six is, is super important for us to understand this because the falling away is, is that they have renunciated all the principles and all the teachings of Christianity. Though they had tasted, though they were there on the fringes, though they saw some of this stuff, this, this, this uh, description that he's giving here of apostate is about the renunciation of the principles and teachings now let's think for just a second. We already talked about Judas, but let's move on to somebody else within that circle of 12. Is there anything that we can say on the night of, that Jesus was arrested and betrayed on his particular night? Is there somebody else that we could bring forward in there that, that, that maybe said, Lord, even if I have to die for you, I will not renounce you. Is there anybody else that fell within that spot? Tell me if there is. Peter. Peter. Okay, you guys read your Bibles. Awesome. This is not what happened to Peter. This is not what Peter did. What Peter did was in this place that none of us have ever been in. You know, he's there on that night. And man, he, Peter's concerned for his life. And what he did in denying Christ was something that he was immediately sorry for. Point being is, is that Peter quickly repented. This is not describing that. And that becomes important for us. Because God is not looking to wipe us out when we make one mistake here or, or we do something wrong there. That's not God. Even, even when it's drastic like this, right? I mean, I mean, Peter straight up denies Christ and yet he knew that, that wasn't, it wasn't right and he repented. On the other side, when you're dealing with the, the apostates or this example of apostates, this just has to do with, hey, people are around this, but, but categorically, they do not believe in the principles and the teaching of Christ. Now, I want to show you this in the, in the Gospels for a second. Some of these verses will be on the screen, but if you can follow with me in your Bible, I sure would love that. Flip to your left to the Gospel of John. And we're going to get an outline of this, or, or at least a similar picture here in the Gospel of John. In the Gospel of John, chapter 6, it is a super long chapter. I'm not going to read this chapter to you. We're just going to kind of cruise across some of the high points in it. Uh, but as, as, we're, as we're in this, we'll pick up at verse 22 and, 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 and we'll move through some high points here. And what we find in this, this scene here is that this is the day following where Jesus had fed 5,000 uh, men plus the women and children. So the, 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 the fish and the loaves, they were broken and 5,000 people were, were fed and all that stuff. Now, now this scene picks up the following day behind that. Take a look at John 6, verse 22. He says this, 
John writes, he says, on the following day, when the people who were standing on the other side of the sea, they saw that there was no other boat there except that one which his disciples had entered and that Jesus had not entered that boat with his disciples, but his disciples had gone away alone. However, other boats came from Tiberias near the place where they ate bread after the Lord had given thanks. Skip down to verse 25. We find, he says here, he goes on and he says, and when they found him on the other side of the sea, they said to him, Rabbi, when did you come here? Now Jesus answered them and he said, he says, most assuredly I say to you, you seek me not because you saw the signs, but because you ate of the loaves and were filled. So the examples that we're going to see here is, is that Jesus did a miracle. That miracle was to testify that he was the son of God. That he had power to do the things that he said he had to do. It was to draw the people using a, 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 a tangible example to the illustration that Christ is the bread of life. That, 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 that is in Christ that we find life. We find life in the present and we find life eternal in Christ. And, and, and while everything was pointing to this, the people, they ate of the loaves, they took of the tangible benefits, the partakers, if you will, around the graciousness of Christ, but they weren't following him because they knew that he was God. And man, to the church in 2022, to the church in our day, man, some of this stuff needs to speak to us because, because I would venture to say that there are people right here, right, right here in this sanctuary. There are folks that are watching online. There are those of you that are listening on the radio. That while you know and you have seen and God has been so gracious in your life where, where, where you've, you've just gotten yourself into a really bad situation because you've walked contrary to God and God has touched, God has helped, God has, has demonstrated his power and his graciousness to touch the circumstance to bring healing. And yet at the backside of that, you've turned your back on God because you never really understood that it was God that was helping you. You never really believed that it was God that was helping you. This is the same thing that's going on with these folks. So, so Jesus addressed the crowd and, and he says, listen, man, the only reason that you're here is because you benefited from the food. They didn't understand, again, that the miracle, what it was pointing to. Now we move on to the second idea. So Jesus goes from the crowd, same situation, same scenario thing here. He moves from the crowd and he goes to the Jews now. Look in verse number 41. It says, and then Jesus, excuse me, the, uh, the Jews then complained about him, about Jesus, because he said, I am the bread which came down from heaven. And they question in their heart, is, is this not Jesus, the son of Joseph? How in the world did he come down from heaven, the verse says. And Jesus sees that they're murmuring. They complained. Now he went from the crowd to the Jews. Nobody's understanding what he did. Now he goes on down and now he addresses the disciples here. Verses 60 to 67. Stick with me here and it'll all come together in a second. Okay? I am going to read you these verses. These disciples that he's addressing here, please understand this is a broad group of disciples. This is not, uh, right here at the start, this is not the 12. Okay? We often refer to the apostles as the, as the disciples. That's not who he's talking to here. This is a broad group of followers. A broad group of people that have been going from town to town with him. Okay? He says this in verse 60. He says, therefore, many of his disciples, when they heard this, they said that this is a hard saying. Who can understand it? Well, what did Jesus say? Well, he said that he's the bread that came down from heaven. He, he, he said that unless you eat of his flesh and drink of his blood, that you have no part with him. This is it. He did the miracle the day before regarding feeding the 5,000 with the bread and in the explanation to the crowd, to the Jews, and now here to some followers, some disciples that had been with him up to this point, they're, they're going, man, this is a hard saying, verse 61. And when Jesus knew in himself that his disciples complained about this, he said to them, does this offend you? What then if you should see the Son of Man ascend where he was before? It is the spirit who gives life. The flesh profits nothing. The words that I speak to you are spirit and they are life. But there are some of you who do not believe. For Jesus knew who they were and who did not believe and who would betray him. And he said, therefore, I have said to you that no one can come to me unless it has been granted to him by my father. 
John 6, verse 66, he says, from that time, many of his disciples went back and they walked with him no more. And then Jesus said to the 12, now you know the 12. He says, do you also want to go away? And Simon Peter answered him and he said, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. Also, we have come to believe and to know that you are the Christ, the son of the living God. Jesus answered them. He says, did I not choose you, the 12, and one of you is a devil? He spoke of Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon, for it was he who would betray him being one of the 12. We have an example of the crowds. We have an example of the Jews. We have an example of the larger spectrum of, of, of the disciples. And then it comes all the way down to the 12. And, and there's even an example of Judas Iscariot in there. The teachings of Jesus, as we study these things, we know that, that, that okay, there might be places where they're, where they're difficult. Sure. But we can understand them. But you know where the difficulty really comes? That, that comes in that area of accepting. That comes in the area of, of believing and doing and responding. That, that comes down to where the real battle lies. And yet there are people that will hang around and, 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 and flip back to uh, Hebrews now, uh, that, that in this example that, that we're given here in the book of Hebrews, that, that, that there were people, these apostates, they were enlightened, they had tasted, they were partakers, they had seen some of the things, much like seeing, you know, the folks that, that, that experienced and saw with those, you know, with the bread and, and, and all the men that were, that were fed there, the 5,000 that were fed. They saw this, they were partakers, they stood on this, and yet they, it's like, mm, no, they, you know, they're turned off on all of these things. They couldn't believe them. They weren't, they weren't really understanding what Jesus was doing. Now he takes us and he leaves that spot and he goes to verses seven and eight and he gives us two illustrations and these illustrations are, uh, are using the ground. And I love this because anytime we get into the, the, the condition of, uh, of, of looking at the ground and how fruitful the ground is, it always brings me back to this place of realizing that in Matthew chapter 13 that Jesus gives, it's like this whole chapter, right? He gives this parable to the masses about the, you know, the, 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 the seed in the soil, right? The word of God and the condition of the heart. And man, it comes to Sunday morning all the time. Every time, every Sunday morning, you hear me say this week by week or season by season, that we get here in this room and on second service in particular, it's so crazy because we have such, such a mix of people. We've got visitors, we've got regulars, we've got guests, we've got everything. Everything is going on. And the condition of this room, the heart condition of this room, because it's so different, those of you that are, that are, that are regular following along on this study, those of you that are visiting, that are, that are, that are solidly grounded within Christ, are here. Others are, are here in this place, and others are even listening on the radio where, where you're listening to these things being taught about Christ, and yet it's like you're, you're in this place where you're pushing off of these truths. You're, you're, you're seeing, you're hearing, but you're not, you're not receiving and accepting that, and, and, and it creates a coldness. And if you'll remember with me, folks, that, that what these guys were in the middle of, the thing that Paul was addressing to the Hebrews is how to be strengthened in hard times. What Paul was giving to them is, is that the conditions of their culture had moved them from leaving Christianity to go backwards into Judaism, into a, a system that was no longer needed. They were going backwards. And, 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 and those that were going backwards is because they couldn't understand the relevance Yes, they were enlightened. Yes, that they may have taken. Yes, they may have, have seen some things and all that stuff. And man, that speaks to the church. Listen, maybe you're sitting in here this morning and you've seen and you've heard and you've done these things. But you know, you come in the church, you gather, you assemble with the saints, I should say. And, and you're right here in the middle of God doing something. And, and, and you're hearing the truth coming from God's word. And, may, and maybe intellectually you can understand some of the concepts that are going on, but you can't digest it. Because these things are only spiritually discerned. And, and, and the time when the church assembles on Sunday morning, it is a time where the saints are being equipped for the work of ministry. 
It is time where, this is the time where, where as the churches come, uh, you know, here, we, we gather, we worship, our hearts are expressed, you know, we're laying down our problems before God, we're looking to God to help us, we're confessing our sin, we're changing direction in our life, we're saying, yes, Lord, yes, Lord, yes, Lord. But in verses 7 and 8, there are soil conditions where there are some, they will receive the word. They will receive the nutrients. They will receive that fresh water, if you will, that comes down and, and, and they'll take it and it'll grow into something. It'll be a blessing from God. But on the other side of that, verse 8, the other side of his illustration, the other part of the land, he says, but if it bears thorns and briars, it is rejected and near to being cursed whose end is to be burned. So he gives that two-sided illustration yeah, he is talking to these Hebrews that were, they were uh, excuse me, uh, uh, yeah, it's a book of Hebrews, Hebrew Christians, Christians that, that second generation that had come out of Judaism and all that stuff. Yeah, he, he's writing to them and he's sharing with them not to go back. And he gives them the crazy examples here of what apostasy looks like and he moves it farther down the line here to give the two different examples there. That, that man, this is, this is a land that is receiving it and this is a land that is not receiving it. In the land that doesn't receive it. I mean, there's a practice that is here. It's still a practice today. Listen, you come to a field that has only uh, briars and tumbleweeds and it's filled with a whole bunch of junk stuff. You, listen, you see people burn fields so that that ground can be, be, can be recultivated with a fresh soil. I'm a hunter. I don't know if that offends you. I'm not trying to offend you, but I hunt big game, elk and deer. Yes, it's awesome. It's great. And you know what? You know one of the places that we love to go hunting? is it one year after a fire has gone through because of all the new sprigs and stuff that is coming up, the animals go there and they feed. It, it suddenly becomes a nutritious ground. And maybe you've had sections of your life that have just been totally ravaged and burnt up and you're not quite sure how to handle it. It's like, okay, oh my goodness, I just did this for this X number of years and it feels like that's a complete loss. But maybe God's doing something different. Maybe, maybe God has had to get rid of some things in, in your life where it wasn't leading to things that are fruitful. That you were just walking a walk where you were partaking of things, but you had no heart behind it. I don't know. But I know the way that he closes this off with, this, with these people is not to move them into a bad spot. And I wanna make sure that you understand the significance here before we, we move forward in this. And I'm always so fascinated. I'm so fascinated about how the same words on this little iPad can come across so differently depending upon the service. For those of you that were here, maybe they were in the first service. You saw that God was doing something different there than what's happening here right now in this service. And I want to make sure that as we close this, that I consciously take a step to go maybe from third or fourth gear and go down to first gear. So that personally, right there in your seat, that you would understand I suspect that much of what we have talked about of a distant people some 2,000 years ago has suddenly fallen upon many of the seats in this room. And you're wondering, is that cold person you? I don't know. I'm not God and I'm not you. But I'll tell you how he speaks to these folks. And I tell you how we should receive this. It's not a heavy trip from God. This is, this is not just a bunch of hot air coming out. But it could be a gut check, depending upon where you're at with the Lord. But he makes sure that he ends this time or this, this remember I told you at the very beginning that this is the number one chapter, number one set of scriptures right here. Four, five, six, seven, eight. 
the number one set of scriptures in the New Testament that is absolutely crazy and painful and hard for any pastor, any commentator, any scholar to teach and to explain the understanding of this thing. It's absolutely insane. But if we miss this tough stuff, we miss the point of the application because it picks up in verse number nine. This is the third idea, and that is trust God and don't turn back. He says, beloved, he says, we are confident of better things concerning you. Yes, things that accompany salvation, though we speak in this manner. So did you see how he just downshifted there? I mean, there's this whole thrust that is going on about talking about all these things and falling away and getting renewed. And he gives all the illustration of a good land and a bad land. And all of this stuff makes you feel like, okay, where am I at in this? And, and then he stops, man. And he downshifts here. And he says to them, he says, beloved, beloved. Can I speak to you that way here this morning? I don't know you. I don't know your story. I don't know, you know, a vast majority of you. I don't know you. I don't know where you're at with the Lord. I don't know if this is just some weekend thing or you're out kind of church shopping or whatever. Hey, listen, I don't care. Wherever you're at, you're sitting here in the sanctuary of God today where worship and the word is going forward. And I pray that God has, a, has an amazing work for, for your life. And I know that according to the scriptures that his heart towards you would be just the same. Beloved. Beloved. And Paul said that he was confident about them. That that, that that time that they had spent walking with God, even though they were in this place of growing doll, even though they were tottering in this sluggishness of their, their Christian faith, even though that was there. He says that God is not unjust, verse 10, he's not unjust to forget your work and your labor of love, which you have shown towards his name. In that you have ministered to the saints and currently do minister. He says, and we desire that each one of you show the same diligence to the full assurance of hope until the end. That you do not become sluggish, but imitate those who through faith and patience inherit the promise. Listen, trust God and don't turn back. Paul was confident, yes. But my question turns towards you on, on, on a much personal level here. And that is what is causing you to turn back today? Have you been one of those persons where you've had those times within your life where you've sensed the Spirit of God working, but now you're in a spot where you don't sense the Spirit of God working? Now you're in a spot when you go to church, it seems dry, dull, boring, and you don't get what's going on. Are, are you living in a place within your life, within your Christian rock right now to, to where this, you know, where, where the assembling with the saints on the Sunday morning has become one of those just, well, I'm supposed to do this thing and I'm just going to do this thing. I'm just going to go there and see what happens, you know. Are, are, are you in this place where, listen, we're two and a half years in through the, uh, the chaos that has happened with COVID. I like to call it the COVID crash because all of our lives were changed. Are you in that place in the aftermath of the COVID stuff going, okay, I think I'm going to be okay. But now you're getting blindsided with, well, inflation is, is, is at a 40-year high. What, what's going to happen now? This is some of you folks that are older than I am, and I, I'm in my early 50s here. You can remember those times in the, in the, the late 70s where this crazy stuff was happening. I, don't know, I, I mean, I don't know how I was so fortunate enough to be you know, alive during that time of of world history, but man, I remember in that time that my mom, we live with my mom, my brother and I, that we would line up for gas in California based on the last digit of our license plate number. And we'd be sitting there for hours. Well, what does that mean to our current moment? I'm not quite sure what's gonna happen with the inflation challenges and the stuff that are going on, but I know what COVID did to the church, and that is, is that it wrecked it, or did it. I'm not sure that it wrecked it at all. It thinned it out. All the churches were thinned out for sure. But in the aftermath of what is coming back to that, there's a sobriety that is coming back. This Christianity that we've had uh, across our country has, has been one that has been tested in more recent years. And, and, and God is doing that work of separating. And if we look upon this particular chapter in such a way to realize that the heart of God 
was to use Paul to strengthen the church in hard times and to bring them out from their dullness, from their sluggishness, from, from tottering on these areas of moving into apostate places because they just disregarded, they totally renounced the things of God. I know that he wants to do that to the church today. He doesn't want his body, his bride, his people, the church, to go to this place to the, where, where they're renouncing the things of God. He doesn't want you and I to move to this place to where in our life that we're denying Christ by the way that we live. He doesn't want us to be labeled as, oh yeah, those are those hypocritical people. They call themselves a Christian, but man, man, that, that bro can knock it back with us at the bar just as good as everybody else. God doesn't want us to be within that spot. God wants to purify his bride. Listen, the time of Christ is nearing closer and closer and closer without question. And not to get sensational, not to, not to, to pick a, a date or to do all that stuff. That stuff is all unbiblical, man. We don't know the day or the hour in which Christ is going to return for his church, but we know he's coming back. And we know that we can discern the signs. And whether it's COVID or whether it's inflation or, uh, oh yeah, by the way, the, uh, you know, the war that's popping on uh, with Russia and Ukraine and all of that uh, global tension that's spilling out around that. Wait a minute. Isn't there something with Russia in the, in the tribulation time where Russia will come down directly north of Israel and, and, and make an alliance and, and come down to try to wage war even against little Israel? Uh-huh. That's in the tribulation time. Are we in that right now? No. We're not in that. But the rumblings and the signs and the leaders and all the stuff that's going on globally, listen, gang, it is to wake up humanity to the reality that Christ is coming back and it is to wake up the church that God doesn't want his church to be tottering and tinkering around in things that they shouldn't be messing with. Uh, go Jesus. And God's not cold towards us. He's not hard. He's not heavy. His, his truth never changes. His love never changes. And, and his truth never compromises his love. And his love never compromises his truth. He's God. And the good things that he has and the stuff that he wants for us. While well, it's his heart to do his good, it's, it's our choice whether we choose to follow him or not follow him. And I'm so grateful for this. I'm going to have them throw up one final verse here for you on the screen. In 1 John chapter 5, verse number 13. The Apostle John, who was previously one of these sons of thunder, he was so rambunctious and want to call lightning down out of the sky to kill some folks and all this stuff. But as he gets later in his years, he writes this. He says, these things I have written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life and that you may continue to believe in the name of the Son of God. The assurance of salvation. God doesn't leave us dead in this passage. He leaves us with this place of hope. But he gives clear direction. And once again, I, I never know where everybody is at in their Christian walk. But I know that we're in that season of the church age of world history. And I know, I know that weekend by weekend, that month by month, day by day, that there are, there are many that, that need to come to a change of understanding, come to repentance, to agree with God once again, and to lay down the lifestyles that have been adopted and the abuse of grace is, well, God will forgive me. God will forgive me. God will forgive me. And, and there's no heart towards God. Yes, tasting. Yes, seeing. Yes, knowing some truths. But there's no heart towards God. John penned this, this, this powerful verse here that we just saw on the screen. He, he penned that after laying out the demonstration of those that say they love God. Here's what should be within their life. This is it. And the assurance that they would be able to know, it comes... John wrote these things is so that they would know that they would have that assurance of where they, they stood with God. He did not write that to justify bad behavior, bad life, bad doctrine, bad living. He didn't write it that way. 
And Paul's not writing it this way. Paul's giving this crazy example here that these folks had moved into this place. And, 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 and gang, you've heard me say this before. Every time we go through one of these, um, whatever the book of the Bible is, it's because we need to learn these particular things in this fellowship. And I know that these are, the broader application extends out to those that are on the radio as this goes all up and down the front range. Man, this goes to the body of Christ. We need to be reminded of these particular things. We need to be brought back to these things. And so I want to ask the, uh, uh, the worship team to come forward here. Uh, and I want to ask that you would close your Bibles here with me. And I want to ask that you would stand to your feet. And I love to hear the children next door <laughs> hooping and hollering out there. Yeah, that is really cool. Man, some days it's hard to give, some days it's hard to teach God's word. This morning in this service would be one of those times where it's very difficult to teach this. But I would ask you, that if you found God speaking to you personally within your chair, about your life. If God is, by His Holy Spirit, has brought to your attention some things in your life, and I want to encourage you to be honest with Him. I want to encourage you to, to recognize that. Tim, you can start playing uh, just a little bit background there. Um... not always at a loss for words, but I feel like I'm at a loss for words this morning. So, Father, as we um, conclude our time here this morning, I know that your word tells me that you and you alone know the beginning from the end. I know that Isaiah tells us that, that you know the future and that you're going to do what you're going to do. I know that Jeremiah tells us that we can call to you and that you'll answer us and you'll show us great and mighty things that we don't know. I know that even this book of Hebrews here has, has taught us in chapter 4 that we can come to the throne of grace to boldly ask for help and mercy in the time of need. I see all the sweet promises of, that, are, that are laced throughout Scripture, but as we navigate through moments just like this. I don't know what you're up to right now. Many times I'm able to discern it, but Father, I must confess this morning, I, it's foggy to me. And so I'm going to give them, Lord, what you gave me. With eyes closed and heads bowed, if God has spoken to you here this morning in any capacity, and you know that he's working in your life, not mine, in your life, will you please raise up your hand so I can see? Keep your hand up, please. All right, I see tens and maybe more than 20, 25, 30 people. Okay, you can put your hands down. Father, you have gotten our attention all across the sanctuary here this morning. And we would call upon you to remember Jesus for us. Remember that it's in Christ that we are justified and not we of ourself. For your word declares to us that our righteousness is as a filthy rag, that it is disgusting before you, and that the only way that we can approach is through him. And you have told us that in Jesus that there is no condemnation. And we have that assurance of salvation that John has written about. And this morning we thank you we thank you that the condemnation has been taken away in Christ and our prayer is that you'd fill us afresh with your Holy Spirit as, as Jesus as you wash us from our sins. 
And I thank you that the completion of your promise does not have anything to do with the performance of our lives. And in the same breath, how it is that you conform us to your will as we yield to you. So wash us. I pray that you would fill these that have responded to you either privately or or publicly, that you would fill them afresh with your Holy Spirit this morning. And I pray your blessings over them. Lord, we're living in very difficult times and it's painful and it's hard and it's frustrating and on every corner, right is wrong and wrong is right and, and, and there's no space for your word within our culture anymore. And yet you've called us out of this world to be your own. We pray, Jesus, that you would come soon for your church, that you would come quickly for your church. Maranatha. With eyes closed and heads bowed, I don't know if I should do this and I ain't done this in months, maybe in this way. And I don't know if now's the right time, but I'm just gonna ask, listen, if if, if there's anybody here that has walked away from Christ and you know that today is a day you need to come back, will you raise up your hand so I can pray for you? I don't know if that applies to anybody. I see you, I see you. Anybody else? You know in your heart that you're walking contrary to God. Okay, Father. And I pray for these very specifically, Lord, that you would tenderly wrap your arms around them as they come back to you here this morning. May you love them greatly. May you help them. May you be close to them. May you... May you clear away the heartaches that are right before them and teach them to stay close to you. Lord, you took a man like me with a gun in my mouth in 1993. I didn't deserve your love, but but you chose to love me. Thank you. And you've chosen to love all of these here this morning. We just lay this time down before you and just, we just say thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. We do this in the mighty name of Jesus and all God's people said, If you need prayer here, uh, Tim is going to close us in a final song, but if you need prayer here this morning, uh, we have both Justin and Gary that will be up front here on the side, and they'd love to spend a few moments of prayer with you. God bless you guys. Thank you for coming out. Um, Next week, your message is bound to be way more exciting than today. Today was a hard check. We'll see you next time. Bye-bye.